Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, my name is Kara Kane. Uh, I work at the Government Digital Service in the UK as the head of the design profession, and I am moderating this fishbowl. Uh, I will introduce the panels uh, in a minute. Uh, just to introduce the format, if anyone hasn't been to one of these yet today, uh, the bowl format, there are empty seats uh, where we are inviting you to join and ask a question uh, to our panelists. Uh, we do have some prepared questions that we're going to go through uh, for probably the first 20 minutes. Um, so then after that point, we'll invite you in. But if you're super eager, I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn you away uh, if you want to jump in earlier on. Um, so that's how it works. We would also uh, like to, um, if you do want to come in, we would like to keep a gender balance. So just keep that in mind uh, for people that are coming in to, to join the bowl. So now I am going to introduce the topic because maybe that would be a good thing to do before we, before we dive in. So this is all about the long slog of public service transformation. Uh, this is a topic that I've started to talk about more and more with colleagues. Um, I myself have been a civil servant for six going on seven years now. Uli is going on 20 plus years. Um, but as digital transformation and digital ways of working start to become more established in governments across the world, um, it means that you know, we're starting to think about how do we stay, how do we gain resilience uh, to work through uh, some of the difficult you know, slog of, of this type of work. Uh, public service design takes a very long time. You're slowly chipping away at institutional bureaucracy. Uh, so how can we keep creative people uh, that have come into government in the public sector, how do we keep people motivated? Uh, help them stay, um, and how do we recruit uh, recruit people as well into this type of work? So that is what we are going to be discussing. So now I will introduce our panelists, and I'm going to use my notes. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce Lawrence Berry. Uh, Lawrence uh, used to work at the UK government uh, digital service on the international team. Uh, now he is working with governments. Uh, that are setting up new digital services um, it, within government in places like Iraq and Somalia. We're also joined by Uli N. Uh, Uli has worked in the public sector in Estonia for 20 plus years, um, helping set up the innovation team in the Estonian government, which just celebrated its fifth anniversary. Um, and now Uli is the director of EU and international cooperation at the Ministry of Education and Research in Estonia. And finally, we have Marco Maria Pedrazzo, uh, head of Design for Digital Transformation, um, the Digital Transformation Department, leading their design profession. Uh, and he also runs Designers Italia, which is a project for design tools and community for public administrations, especially the ones who don't have money for tools and capability. So very excited to be joined by these panelists, uh, who are also part of our international design and government community. So we have a, a little poster over there, <laughs> which is our, uh, our community <laughs> brand. Uh, we would love to have posters all over. Um, the International Design and Government community started in 2017. It's a community bringing together thousands of people um, who are either designers or people with a design mindset working in the public sector all across the world. We have s over 70 countries represented in our community um, and around 4,000 people. Um, we regularly have calls where we discuss different themes, but we also try to meet up in person. Uh, and we are very excited to be meeting up with some of our community members in person uh, for the first time really since COVID. So really excited to be here and to have you all in this conversation. So I am going to kick us off with the first question that we wanted to discuss. So the first thing we're going to discuss is what has been easy to change and what has been hard? And I'm going to, to go to Uli. Hello, everyone. Mm. Speaking of easy and hard, I, I have a confession to make. Uh, it's extremely hard mo and hot moment for me. Ten minutes before our discussion, I spilled a coffee on me, so uh, I had to put a coat on. <laughs> you bear with me as the discussion is already, before it starts, very hot for me. <laughs> but, um, but speaking of what's, what's hard, I think um, I can resonate well with the discussion which took place today in the morning in the opening panel as well, referring to the to the mindset and, and mentality. Uh, and I often have the feeling that uh, by nature we are quite resilient to change. We like the things as, as is, even if we are not very satisfied with them. 
And um, I can bring you an example from the from the Estonia, uh, from South Estonia, uh, a town called Tartu, which is a big university town. And for fourth year in a row, um, the biggest road in the center of the town is closed for one month uh, as a car-free avenue with alongside with a rich cultural program <laughs> to bring a different kind of rhythm of the of the life uh, into into the city. And then they started for the first uh, year. There is a lot of resistance to that. And people predicted that it's going to be a chaos in traffic. People will not come to that uh, area for the cultural program, so on and so forth. And what, what I think is interesting is that they also monitored, the organizers monitored also the, the references in the, in the media to their initiative. And before the event, uh, it was mostly negative. So nobody saw that it could bring a, a good change, an initiative like that. Then during the, the first uh, year, uh, it started to change, really. And after the first year experience, it was mainly positive. And I think this serves as a good example uh, uh, that um, this mindset of, of towards the changes is, is very hard to come with. But I think it's also very difficult to convince people theoretically so for me, what, uh, what is the most powerful advocate for a positive change is the lived shared experience. So, so maybe that's for, for the start. Thank you. Yeah, just showing, showing delivery, showing how things can work. Um, I think Lawrence has had some examples of, of tools in using that for change. Yeah, I've, I've been reflecting on uh, places I've worked where they've wanted to create change or they wanted to solve a problem. For example, something simple like or maybe not so simple, making everything across government look consistent. So they put out a procurement, they, buy, they want to just buy a thing that fixes that problem, buy a design system, and then they realize they have a big consultancy maybe comes in, develops a design system, and leaves, and nobody uses it, and they've probably spent, I don't know how much they would spend on something, but it could be a lot of money. Um, they spent all this money, and then it doesn't meet the needs, or maybe it met the needs of of the community at the time, uh, but it's not maintainable, it doesn't last, just because the community in the government doesn't really feel like it meets their needs because they don't have like a contribution process and things like that. So that was one thing that I thought was easy, an easy thing that we could, could buy to solve a problem, but hard to actually um, maintain that in the long term. Whereas you, maybe if you took the community approach of investing in teams, um, a design system team, for example, for that challenge. Um, and I think that also reflects on sometimes when you go in as a practitioner, maybe you're uh, on a contract or something, you can propose, here's a product that would be really useful, so I'm just gonna build it, or I'm just gonna create this product, and then I'm gonna leave. And it often falls on people that are already burdened to maintain these things. So I think maybe using technology to, to fix our problems is not as easy as we think in government. Especially without matching that, having that mindset shift to then back it up or to have, yeah, the kind of buy-in of the, the mm. maintenance to continue it. And I think, Marco, you had, a, had an example of that. Yeah, and it's great being here. Thank you for, for, for having us. And I will make a disclaimer, as Uli did, like I'm Italian, so I tend to have a gesture, and this is basically half in my capacity. So like, I'm, and I'll, I'll try to live with that. Um, yes, yes and yes. Um, we oftentimes think that innovation is about tools, um, but there are different types of innovation. Like you can you can build small and robust, or you can build you know large and and very um, markety, let's say. And the two things are not born equal, especially in the public sector, because then, then you're on the risk of leaving the burden of what you're building uh, to somebody else. And I can give you an example. In in Italy, we are in in a very long process of building up uh, a design system. In a way, it's similar to the example Lawrence was making before. Um, and we're very deliberate about what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, there it, we, we could build on many different languages and many different libraries and many different things, but we, we know that we are not infinite and the team is not infinite and the budget has some visibility in time, but not all the visibility in the world. And then if 8,000 municipality depends on that design system, I mean, you have to be bulletproof sure about what you're doing. So building small, maintaining few things, 
core and then building a community around them that can maintain, for example, other libraries or uh, other particular cases or um, even upgrading your contribution model to a tool. And that, that I think it's, it's, it's key and it's the way at least I think it's, it's, it makes more robust in the long term and in the long run. Yeah, we were talking about this before, uh, like a commons approach, and kind of the idea of stewardship. So like you need to have the mindset shift, you need to have like, you know, you can show through delivery, sometimes that's the easy way, but then you also need like the maintenance and then the community around a thing to, to give it that life uh, and to, to keep around it and to keep it going. Uh, and that kind of leads really nicely into our second second topic, which is around experimentation. So how, how have you used experimentation and what beliefs and values have you had to try and shift to make space for experimentation? Um, Marco, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I a bit anticipated what we were saying now. Like, the, it's true what Woody was saying, you need to show, you know, result and you need to show progress. Even if, even if it's small, you need to make it material. Otherwise, it's very difficult for not for everybody, but for a mass of people that needs to move to bring the real change in, in the public sector. So you, you start building small, but it should not be um, like that, that those bad type of innovation that leads to more technical debt or to more uh, content creation burden on people who are already suffering from, from overworking and overburdening. So, um, and it, that's one of the reasons why why you should be really deliberate in in understanding what are the boundaries of what you you, you can do. And and again, I think that there's there's positive way of doing innovation. There's a negative way of doing innovation in in the public sector. And definitely, you know, robustness, thinking systemically. So thinking about how your work impacts other people, and not just you know get rid of dependencies and think you can develop a tool that you know it's the, the rightest, the most technologically advanced, uh, the, the f most forward looking without looking at the real context of real people struggling in, uh, in at the periphery of that tool. Yeah, I think sometimes experimentation in the public sector looks like something quite simple from the outside. Like a simple solution could actually be like a provocative experiment at the same time. Actually, that reminds me uh, an interesting experience, uh, speaking of provocative experiment. Uh, um, as you know, the, the member states of the European Union are holding the, the presidencies at the Council of the European Union, and Estonia did so in 2017. So I used to work in the Estonian permanent representation uh, to the European Union in, in Brussels. And um, you remember in the morning they said that uh, in, the, in the opening panel that do the people in the public sector always wear suits? I can confirm that in, in the Council of European Union, mostly they do, <laughs> the grey ones. But um, so what we tried, and, and uh, speaking of, of also what, what you emphasize, and I think it's, it's really one of the, the, the most important things, is how do you open it up also to the people who are concerned? And um, as you know, in the, in the Council of, of European Union, the ministers meet for the ministers' meeting. So they discuss, there is a part of the public discussions, and it's, it's streamed. So in principle, all the, the citizens can watch it and, and think along to the ministers. The truth is that for most of the people, this is not really the format. They, they, they feel it's attractive or, or easy to follow. And I was working for the um, European Youth Ministers uh, format at that time. And we were really discussing how could we do so or how could we make it happen that the young people would also be somehow involved when the ministers discuss the issues concerning young people. So what we did was that we, we were trying to put forward the practice and experiment, we might call it like that today, uh, that um, for this very specific ministers meeting, uh, it would not only be one-sided that the citizens can watch the ministers, but they, through Twitter, could also have their say, and the ministers, while they are discussing, will be able to follow the discussion, what the comments or, or tweets are, and then base their discussion on, on that as well. And uh, when we proposed it, we, we got so much resistance, and, and, and we, we heard a lot like it's not going to be possible because the ministers do arrive with the prepared um, positions from their country, so it's not really the, so dynamic or, or so much uh, building up on, on spot. Uh, we, we were told also that the young people would not be interesting to do so, and so on and so forth. 
we tried it. Actually, what happened was that through the representat uh, representation organizations of young people and, and youth sector, we managed to engage the young people. So there were actually tweets actively taking place while, while the debate was going on. And on the other side, we, we saw that more than half of the ministers actually took the time to follow what the young people are saying and also react on that. So it came out that also ministers are human beings and they are actually very much interested in what the people are saying. And I think this is also a, a kind of example in a way that sometimes we just have to give it a try because we didn't know what we didn't predict. The practice, unfortunately, is not continuing. So if you are working with international matters and uh, by, by chance your presidency is, is approaching soon, maybe that would be my call to try out also what can we do actually in European Union level and international institutions because sometimes I think these are rigid enough in order to, to use experimentation as well. And just maybe to, to close, I think in Estonia, the, in public sector, we see more and more the experimentation used as a tool as well to advance the, the, the changes. Uh, this uh, Monday, we just launched uh, the um, uh, guide for experimentation in the public sector. And again, the guide itself will not do the trick. But I think it's a step forward to help to build up the competencies and the courage as well. And I know we are not the only country, so there are existing materials and tools like that. Maybe that would be interesting that we also try to build up on the, on the things which are there and might be a good source for us to, to be based upon. Yes, I know that GDS and gov.uk are going to be interested to see that. I think experimentation has been a word that we're talking about a lot uh, in, uh, in GDS, specifically in the UK government. So definitely interested in, in that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, so the next theme, kind of going back to this idea of the, the long slog. Uh, so this is about what keeps you going. How do you ensure that yourself and others stay motivated, excited, empowered, and creative, and can work towards resilient and sustainably um, towards more fundamental transformational change. So what, yeah, what keeps you going? How do you, how do you get through this long slog of public service transformation? And we're gonna start with Lawrence. Um, again, I'm just gonna share some observations, and I kind of wanna represent a team that I worked with who couldn't be here today, um, the Digital Services Factory in Cyprus. Um, we worked with them for 18 months and we were kind of paired up in relationships. So I had, um, the, I had the designers paired up with me and we worked for about a year and a half. And yeah, we, they were trying to come but they couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, but reflecting on some of the work we were doing there is there was so much pressure as a new digital services factory and having that in your name to be a factory that is delivering more and more services to show the minister that this idea was good and that it's, it, it was um, a successful project. Um, where really what they are is a digital transformation team within their government. So what they, what they are doing is creating standards, um, design systems, um, patterns and things like that. Um, even creating new job roles, like ad new agile ways of working. Um, but because of this pressure, there was always a conflict. They were doing that on the side whilst always delivering as many services as possible. Uh, occasionally, someone will come in the office and say, where, where are the 400 services you were supposed to build? It's a team of 10. And they were doing everything that GDS did <laughs> with 800 people, uh, which is kind of innovative um, and quite fun. Um, but in that situation, the motivation can hit rock bottom. And I'm just ref I was reflecting on times when, the, when it peaked, um, and I think People see it as they're coming in to do their job, they're getting orders from above to deliver this. They know that this is, they've done training, they've learned about design. They were not designers before, or, um, or maybe they're new to the role. Um, so so they've gotten passionate about what was right to do, putting in standards, working, uh, being accessible, things like this, doing discovery work. Um, but because of the pressure, they couldn't do that, or they felt they couldn't. Um, and I think the moments where their motivation peaked was when they were presenting their work to other people. So there was a big supplier event where they announced their new standards to suppliers. Um, and Yoda, the service designer, she was stood up on the stage in front of 500 people. And it wasn't until afterwards that she said to me that she's never talked about her work before. It's always the senior person talks about the work and doesn't mention the team. 
And ever since then, I think they realized the how all the building blocks fit together of government and the impact that they will have on real people. So my reflection, I think, is, is a way of motivating, uh, having some motivation is talking about your work and being given that space to be able to do so. Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, the recognition aspect of it is so yeah, important right. to be able to see the thing that you're doing is being recognized, especially mm -hmm. by your leadership and your peers is really powerful. Yeah, and think, and ever since they're sharing stuff on LinkedIn, if you look them up on LinkedIn, you'll see all their work that they're doing. So good. Um, I think Marco was gonna, was gonna say something that you've, you've started, which is kind of the name of the, the conference, which is the, the kind of balance of being the creative and then being the bureaucrat. <laughs> yeah, and it, that, that definitely resonates to me, actually, uh, on, on two hats. One of, as a person, uh, a designer needs to manage designer. So um, regarding, I found it particularly interesting when you said, because of the pressure, they couldn't do it, or they thought they couldn't do it. That, that, that there's a big gap in that. And the gap is, to me, uh, from a manager perspective, always spending the time of um, polishing, updating, and building on top of a vision spending time with teams also like to gather and say like look the, the context has shifted in this and that way can we rearrange uh, the way in which we think about things objects tools uh, patterns um, processes so that it fits the the, the movie context um, and because they, they, they say with the, the right why uh, people can endure many different hows um, so, so that one part of it. The, the other one is more on, the, on, a, on a practical level. The power of community-driven projects makes it such that if you properly organize all the different things that a community gathers around to produce, like if you always make sure that people who want to contribute have a practical way to contribute, makes it such that when a specific designer is particularly frustrated with one particular situation in which there's little control that uh, uh, myself or managers or himself can apply, then at least they have sort of a, a background channel that they, they can you know, take small chunks of work, see immediately the impact that has and contribute to a larger vision and that that to me has proven particularly uh, efficient. It, it, it helps pushing ahead projects and helps uh, sanitizing uh, situations that, that, are, that are not properly healthy. And, and it's a kind of a win-win. Totally, yeah. In my work at GDS, uh, the, I uh, have a community of designers. And for them, the community is what keeps them going often. And it's like the support as well that comes from that community. So it's like having a project to do, but then also having people to vent to and get support from. Yeah, and, and typically community is pretty like uh, abstract terms. But I'm, when I'm thinking about project driven community, it's really like listing, listing jobs and tasks to be done so that people can, you know, get, at a glance, get, a, get, get a, an idea of where they can contribute, like really on a practical level. It's, it's sort of a to-do list in a way. Could be could be the the GitHub uh, repo you're working on. Could be uh, a sets of open challenges public on on a website. We've done that with universities. Um, it, it could be really broad, but it needs to be practical. Otherwise, you know, people spend more time thinking about how they can contribute rather than properly contributing and seeing the result of the work. And then you miss the the goal of uh, of uh, you miss the point of you know doing practical things very quickly with early, very early on visible results. Yeah, great. I think, Uli, you had an example of um, kind of differing ways of working uh, around a problem in, in Estonia. Yes, if you ask about, uh, it, it strikes me in your question about um, that, that how can we be more resilient and sustainable in, in responding to transformations. And I, I fully second to the idea of empowering the individuals contributing to the processes as well as the community dimension. But I think additionally, for me, one of the, the, um, the, the, the important building blocks is actually uh, how much flexibility we have within the public sector to, uh, to mobilize ourselves. And um, I can bring here the example uh, related to the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine currently. 
uh, which uh, or where in Estonia has been very strongly affected among with the, with the rest of the world. Um, also, we've been among the, the countries with the highest number of war refugees uh, hosting uh, per capita. So you can imagine that in the field of education, where I'm involved in every day, it really comes to back to very practical decisions. How do we reorganize a life now Then we have a class like that? And one third or half is Ukrainian refugees who have arrived all of a sudden in Estonia. So I think it's we're facing really um, mm, most difficult questions, how very quickly change to be able to mobilize and offer help what is needed. Um, what we did within the ministry is that um, I think we are a very classical ministry in the sense we have departments like like it is very often the, the structure or how the public sector is, is or the organizations are built up. And what we did was what we um, organized a multidisciplinary task force specifically working to solve this or the, to solve or find solutions to the, to the Ukrainian war uh, uh, crisis related questions. And um, it has really uh, been a learning lesson in a sense that it has worked well how you mobilize the different competencies within the ministry actually to, to deal with a challenge like that. And it has made us think also like how much room there should be within an institution like that for this kind of quickly mobilized uh, task forces uh, in addition to the very standardized process of, of uh, structure. So I think this is something which we are thinking like what would it mean for the future? Uh, what kind of further task forces there might be needed, how we are able to mobilize, how do we recruit people related to this, all kind of things like this, like what would it change actually in the institution as well then? Yeah, I think we've seen this a lot with, you know, COVID responses in departments, like you're truly agile, you're coming around a thing and just you have to respond to it and you have some autonomy in your team working truly agile and then we just end up going back to our usual ways of working. So how do we how do we keep some aspects of of that without the kind of heightened pressure, which is not sustainable to to work under all the time? Um, as we're getting to halfway, I would love to start to invite people in. If you have a question, please come come join us. What a thought! <laughs> yes, anything you want to add. You're very welcome. And Marco had the specific rule that when you come already, you have to stay at least three and a half minutes. Yeah, but but that, that, that we should have told after they came up. So. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Off we go. Here we go. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I, I feel I'm the party pooper in this conference. <laughs> in this <laughs> festival. Uh, because I, I love the, this uh, positive, like choosing positive cases in Europe and like highlighting them. And the one before, I think I was highlighting more the Global South, I feel it's more uh, Europe-related. So those are positive examples. At the same time, like, European bureaucracy is way far behind in terms of transforming public services. And I'm going to compare it to private sector, so it's very easy for me to be, my identity to be identified on an online bank, where I'm totally identified, I do all transactions, but I set up a business in, in Germany, I should go personally to the public notary to to to, uh, ratif to uh, identify me that I exist as a human being, which is very interesting. So there is a whole value chain that's created around uh, public services that are not transformed. So my question is, how how do you incentivize? How do you deal with the uh, the stakes that exist, being clientelism or being? changing my function I've been doing for 20 years that has no value. The salaries, the, the, ins the financial incentives versus the, f the new functions um, I should be having. So how do you create, how do you deal with those so many stakes, experimentation, failure? This government has failed in testing Obamacare or another form. So how do you, how do you in incentivize bureaucracy to do this and uh, remove all the stakes that are involved? I'm the party pooper in this festival. I feel it. Usually I'm positive. It's a great question. It's a very, very hard question. Does anyone, anyone want to start? I have a partial response, and then I'm going to leave the chair for somebody else. But, um, and it's really personal in a way. It's not, you know, in my government position or anything like that. But the name of this panel is the long slog because it's long. And 
the way in which I address personally how you know to, to keep moving forward in a thing that 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 doesn't respond really well to sudden steering or or sudden push, but you know re responds better like a like a sailing boat, you know, that you need to gentle, you know, bend and move and repoint and redirect and 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 then there are some moments in which you need to be fast, but there are really few and really particular one is actually. And this was something I also told during the interviews for hiring. Like it, it's like going hunting and, and having to shoot hundred bullets, and then you 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 get three to. You get. <laughs> Someone seconds to you. Uh, well, we can welcome the <laughs> welcome to the stage. Sorry for that. Yeah. No, don't worry. I'm um, here. I don't know what, what happened. <laughs> Oh, no, we, we, we can welcome it on stage. <laughs> so maybe it wants to join. <laughs> no, the, the way in which I'm, I'm, I'm really framing it is that it, it, it's normal for it to be uh, intense and really effort intensive and, and sometimes low, but you need to cheer every time you do a small step forward. I was, told, I was telling you before that I'm impaired without you know, being able to just... Um, Every time you, you, you move something a little bit further ahead, you have to you have to think positive and, and you know stick to that and build on top of it. And there's always gonna be areas of uh, in, in my case of digitalization of public sector and, and especially in human centered design applied to that, in which there's somebody else in the government doing something else. So you focus on where it sticks. And you know where, where the seed plant it grows, and then you invest all your time in that, and over time it can change. That area is not productive anymore, so you, you you reframe and you point to something else, and you celebrate each small win. And again, going practical, um, the in the Zeners Italia, for example, we have two website models that apply to 8,600 municipalities and 8,000 schools. Really low adoption for three four years. Just, you know, there was no money in there, there was no competencies in there, there was no time, there were other priorities. But still, we wanted to show that, I mean, if you are too small to make it on your own, the government is here, close to you, listening to you, helping you out designing things. Now, all of a sudden, that there's a chance of recovery fund. Oh, wow. So now we have a lever to amplify communication, to finance transformation, to, to make sure that something that was ready that was a small win before, all of a sudden become, by 2026, 80% of municipalities, 80% of schools should have the same degree of digital services, which is the one that was uh, seeded years ago by people who were in the, in the same department prior uh, of me coming. So that's my personal answer, though. So I don't know if it, it, it applies everywhere all the same, but that, that's what keeps me personally going. And, and with this, I'm leaving the chair to somebody that wants to balance. Um, well, I was kind of thinking of the UK. You, you touched on that we're kind of learning how to innovate again. So in the UK, if we go back 10 years, 10 years ago, perhaps there was too many people trying to innovate in the public sector. Um, it was a mess. And we were kind of trying to reel it back in and fi focus on fixing the plumbing, I suppose. Can we get the basics right so that somewhat everybody can use the basic services. And I think now it feels like a shift in time where maybe it's okay to start looking beyond the, the plumbing mm. and understand, okay, what, what does, do we just need this simple taxonomy gov.uk website or can it be more personalized or, or does it manage your services for you somehow? But yeah, I think um, it seems like a time to start learning to innovate again. I don't know what that means for the UK government. Yeah, I also thought that uh, I'm afraid I don't have a very um, specific answer. But what I, what I strongly believe in line with your question is that I think we really have to start normalizing the normal in, in public sector. Because uh, we are so strongly believing that uh, the people working in the public sector should know the answers to all the problems, uh, should be able to... to uh, propose the solutions uh, to, the, to the challenges we face around. Um, and it puts a lot of stress also to the people. 
and uh, it makes the experimentation extremely challenging. And I think this is also something we really have to start working to, to realize that uh, I, I doubt that there is any institution who knows the, the, all the right uh, answers to the, to the problems we are facing. But somehow the public expectation towards the public uh, sector is that you should. And I think this is also something which maybe uh, brings along the role of communities, the role of anybody in society who could actually be uh, thinking together what the solutions could be. And maybe that would be something I think we really have to work towards as well. Otherwise, we, um, we uh, risk uh, uh, that we will not be able to engage the people who might want to give it a try in the public sector, maybe to put it like this. Do you, do you feel like that, <laughs> that answered <laughs> what, you were, answer? what you were answer? What's your answer to that? No, no, my, my experience is mostly in, in uh, the global south, in fragile states, where it's a, it's a whole different conversation because the, I asked this question in previous sessions, so I don't want to repeat myself, probably some of the people are here. So, so how do you do uh, uh, public service transformation in contexts where it's highly, pol highly politically polarized, where there are political alliances that takes over your role as a, as a public servant? How do you deal in areas, I, I don't want to say corruption, but highly corrupt where you're removing very important incentives for a large group of people because it, now they cannot be corrupt anymore, and clientelism and political affiliations, and weak in the institutional capacity. I was, there was a session now like about like how, how a lot of the conversation does not apply in the rural areas or the global south, which is very interesting to see how Europe is evolving to this, where we're still talking about digital transformation, where AI, now there are so many things that bureaucrats are doing that are no longer needed literally no longer needed. Like most of those papers that we fill now are not needed anymore. We no. hope. And the machine can do that. But we're still thinking of how, what, how we're gonna digitally transform public service. It feels like we're back, we're, we're still one step behind in the process, mm -hmm. no? I'm gonna move. <laughs> so I don't take too much space. You did your three and a half minutes very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm, yeah, uh, I'm Martin Jordan, I'm head of uh, design user research at the uh, German government's digital service. And um, there was uh, the keyword community um, and uh, we talked a little bit about timelines. And like one of the things that we have seen is that like, yeah, as you said at the beginning, Karen, like that transformation just takes so much time. And then one thing that I'm really trying to, in my mind, like figure out, how do we work in a truly like agile and quick and like the documentation is the code way, but at the same time acknowledging um, when you look at LinkedIn at all these government uh, innovation units or like digital transformation units, people often like stay around like three years. So how do we document only what, 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 what's needed at the same time make sure that multi-generations of designers, engineers, product managers, all of them kind of like have enough stuff to like pick it up and continue the work. And of course like context change and like needs maybe not changing that much, but I mean, government priorities are changing. How do we continue the work, have not like a massive burden of documentation, but still allow people to continue the work in the right way, in the, in the right format? <laughs> That's such a big, big, uh, big challenge that we have. Uh, in UK government, like no one wants to write an onboarding document that ends up being a hundred, a hundred pages. But that's the type of information that you need. So how do you do that in an agile, agile way without spending all your time then updating the thing as well? But maybe the answer is more around our kind of standards and principles of working, which gives you the the scaffolding and the structure of the work. But then I feel like you always need the people that are. You have to know, I mean, my, all of my work is just like knowing who the people are. So who's the person that's been in the organization for so long that knows all the discoveries that have happened so that when you hear the next you know, project being launched, you can say, here's all the things you should look at. Like you need, you need these knowledge managers. Uh, and right now it's all in their, their brains and not much is written down. <laughs> I think that's a good point, right? Because like, even though the average might be three years, some people stay a decade, 
and you can you can ha you have to identify them and they hold so much knowledge and they might even like know where to go and where to find the right thing on a drive i remember in my in my gds days like occasionally i was like typing a thing into into google drive and a presentation from like 7 years ago would pop up and i'd be like oh wow oh wow oh wow they've been discovering the same thing we just like spend a lot of like time and money on to discover so like ah oh, how can we yeah uh, how can we? I mean, and that's that's just a thing. Like in, in in one organization, if you have especially like larger service areas where l various government agencies and government departments might be involved, like this information is often like held in the silo, and like other organizations, like people from other organizations, don't have access to that at all. So even this kind of like serendipitous uh, discovery of some content like might not be possible at all. Yeah, I feel I'm. Oh, sorry. I'm just gonna say that's why we blog about our work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Marco Hi, came Derek. back, and Derek is there. Yeah. Great. So I know blogs have become the thing, but I almost feel like that's the wrong medium. Why aren't we using wikis? Like, shouldn't wikis be the thing that we use to communicate this information? Because then everybody can collectively edit it. We get like a collective knowledge base from that. Like Wikipedia is this incredible source of information that we go to all the time. But in government, we write blogs. Blogs are individuals or sometimes teams. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of get lost in the ether, and you might bump into them later. Whereas a wiki, you can go, you can search, you can find information. So I guess that's the question I came here to ask, is why aren't we using wikis? I seem to always end up on a blog when I'm looking for something to solve a specific problem. I find someone's blogged about it. If I end up in a, I feel like if I end up in a wiki, I feel a bit overwhelmed by information. Like, should I start looking around? Do I look under the, the menu of tabs? Um, this leads to another, whereas a blog is, seems like a distinct snippet in time for me. Um, yeah. maybe I think like, in German government, there's um, a small community um, of, of people who are looking at a cross-government yeah. layer design system at the moment. And they've been using uh, opencode.de, which is kind of a uh, German government-run uh, wiki. So I, yeah, I think it's like a starting point, but the question is always like, how do you, how do you keep and maintain a good structure? Because I think it can be uh, uh, very quickly a bit, mm. bit messy. Yeah. I know um, in the health service in the UK, they have this serendipitous meeting where everyone from across the health service, the researchers meet up. They're in different organizations. Um, they, are work they have a working group for this knowledge base. Maybe that's like a wiki. And then they have a Slack bot that whenever anyone mentions a keyword of research, it takes them to a specific bit of their knowledge base. So they're trying to use more uh, serendipitous, like create more points of that. I like that word. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep saying it. I'm mistake. gonna withdraw. And I was just thinking, since you, you left, I'm gonna turn it like this. <laughs> that, um, I'll come back quickly. In my PhD research, I'm, I'm focusing on educational commons, which basically looks how a learning community builds up a resource together and then also utilizes it. And I think this goes very well in line with your thought that how can we actually document in a way that it's more also collaborative and, and it's about community behind. Because I think the, the one uh, weak side of, of uh, Martin's uh, question or the, 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 what, what it refers to a weak side is that we are very often based on individuals in the knowledge and how much it is going on or not going on. And I think your point about using Wikipedia or other community uh, built up uh, solutions and tools might be a partial uh, answer to that as well. But I think it's also something we really have to learn how to do because uh, my observation or, or experience is that we are not so familiar and, and we really don't often know how to work like that or with tools like that as well. When I, one of the things I should have mentioned before I ran off was um, uh, there are examples, like in Canada we have GCpedia, which is just a wiki that exists within the government of Canada. There's been an attempt to make it more public into GC Wiki, which is basically just the same thing but in the public domain, whereas GCpedia is behind the firewall, so it's only federal government of Canada employees. But GCpedia has been wildly successful within the government of Canada as an information source, it's collective, and it becomes that institutional memory that can carry over from time to time to time. I know there's been talks about doing it in the UK, uh, but I don't think those have really gone anywhere beyond just conception stage. Um, I think there is a need for like a global uh, wiki of government's resource sharing. Uh, I mean, that's something I'm pushing for in apolitical. I'm like, we should do a wiki, guys. Uh, so hopefully that will happen at some point. And it doesn't need to be, I don't care where it is. It just, I think we need a global wiki um, as an experiment just to see what would happen. So 
If anyone's interested, come talk to me. I'll put a like on that idea. I think it's very interesting. It's also uh, what I found also helpful, and, and, I'm, and I'm not disregarding the, the idea of wiki, com uh, completely the opposite. It, it, it's fascinating. It's also try to keep documentation and information and pattern of choices uh, of decision-making processes done as close as possible to the final artifact so that people can do discovery while they see the specific artifact they are exploring. So for example, um, we make huge uh, deal of, uh, of work on commenting sections or that, that, that state stored in within the file or uh, change log in, in the curation of change log in, in a very detailed manner so that they can stay close to where the artifact is. Uh, most likely it's not enough, of course, because you cannot connect horizontally through different so stages, but it, it, it's also very helpful, and it, it requires also a lot of discipline. Mm. The, the documentation is key with that. I, I think, final thing I'll say, and I'm gonna sit down. Uh, what we found in Canada is we needed to have a social component to go with the wiki. So we created GCpedia, and then we created GC Connects, which was basically Facebook for government behind the firewall, open source. Um, and those two things together were needed. In the case of Wikipedia, there's a whole like social section behind the front end that everybody sees where all these conversations happen. So you need not just the documentation, but there's a social piece a doc that comes with the documentation. I'm going to move to our last Last input, question or comment? Okay, we thank don't you have so much, much time. Yes, I'm <laughs> gonna be very quick. I'm Sharon, the background of, the, I'm Sharon from Hertley School Executive Education. So the thing is, the background of this is basically because we are, maybe you can say contributor, with, we're, we're also helping in the training of at least many public sector in terms of transformation. So the question is actually, I don't know if it's easy or difficult, but you were going back to the provocative um, ex, um, experimentation, you know, uh, or experimentation in general. So my question for all of you would be, what would be um, maybe the best way to do experimentation? And I'm talking about what level in the government. Should you go executive? Should you go to the middle level? Or should it be best to do it in the city level? And why? Or it's more of like a question also if there's already best practices or actually negative experiences when we try to do it in, in different levels as well. So that's my final question. That's Thank great. You. I think that maybe um, I can go out. Sure. That uh, kind of ties into the last question that we wanted to discuss, which is, if you had a magic wand, what would you change oh. to remove an obstacle? So I think that's a great one to end on. So how how can you experiment, and what might you have to to change in order to do that? Well, I think uh, that as an answer to a question. In my experience, what I have seen, uh, either from my own activities or from what I've seen colleagues doing in the public sector, is that it really depends. I think the experimentation can work in, in different levels, in different contexts, and it really depends on, on what you are jumping at and what, what's, what's your ambition. Mm, so, so I don't think that there is a, a general rule for that. Um, your question, uh, specifically for education, um, inspires me to also um, reflect on, I'm, I'm now working mostly on education yeah, in the Ministry of Education and Research. I think education is a very interesting context or sector in relation to innovation because on one hand we, we, we describe all the, all the problems we have and, and whatever can happen in the future and we expect that the education is something which help us to prepare for this, yeah, for this unknown. And at the same time, if we look at, at how the education is run, it's, um, we, we still don't really look at the user's experience much enough in, in the education sector. And I'm, I'm, of course, now generalizing it in large terms, but very often you went to school, you suffered from it, and you expect your children also suffer because this feels serious <laughs> education then. Of course, life is more colorful than that, but, but as, a, as a statement, I, I, I would really like to sort of to, 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 um, put forward the idea that um, 
We put a lot of expectations towards the education, but at the same time, the changes in education, we are quite resilient to, to push forward to. And it's a very interesting phenomenon of, of, of conservative game changer than what, what we actually expect from, from education. I think this is a food for thought, actually, how much we are ready to, to push forward the boundaries and try something else and, and uh, do it in, in the education. And uh, just to bring an example, in Estonia, we are currently um, having very interesting um, initiatives on, uh, from, from the government level, like a personalized learning path. So we really try to utilize more the data from learning on individual level and facilitate the future learning for the individual in a very different way, how it has been used so far. It's from the state. But at the same time, we also have um, really interesting new initiatives from edtech sector, a growing sector of education technology. So I think it's really very different context. And, and I strongly believe that these kind of examples can be actually uh, change makers in a such conservative uh, field as we have in, in education, for example. Amazing. Um, 30 seconds left for any other, Sorry. <laughs> any other response try to be super short in terms of education I, if i can decide where to start i go the higher as possible so we, we, with the that we just finished for example training of continuous education of uh, public sector manager for 2000 people in the last two months uh, whereas when we, we need to build new things and experimenting on making stuff the smaller the better because it's much easier to come as the you know the underdog with very little budget with very clear constraint and you know to show a demonstrator that if it grips, then it can grow, but it, it's smaller. It's easier to start on a smaller scale because you have to make fewer people uncomfortable with the risk. In a way. I think we're out of time. Um, we have left some newspapers, some service gazettes dotted around the room. If you would like to grab one, there are stories of um, international examples and case studies of public service transformation. Uh, thank you all for joining and come come chat to us if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.